You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. You've seen these stories. They pop up in our news feeds and on our Twitter feeds and our Facebook feeds on a nearly daily basis. I'm talking about the feel bad story disguised as a feel good story. This week in the Atlanta Journal Constitution reported that there's this cute little blonde six year old boy with a really bad case of diabetes and he was out selling pumpkins to raise the money he needs, money his family needs, to provide him with the life saving service dog that he needs, a dog that will alert the boy when his blood sugar drops to really dangerous potentially lethal levels. The piece takes an attaboy tone throughout. Good for you, kiddo. You get out there and you raise that money. And the kid did raise $5,000, which is one fifth of the $25,000 the dog will cost. So yeah, four more Halloweens and this kid is set, provided he's not dead. This summer, news channel KTSM, first live local, reported this supposed to be heartwarming story a six-year-old girl was out there selling lemonade to help pay for her mother's chemotherapy. Quoting from the piece, Sophia's brother, Jonathan Castro, told KTSM, first live local, their mother has colon cancer. He said Sophia does not fully understand what that is, but knows her mom needs monetary help because she's stopped working. I'm making lemonade because I want to help my mom, Sophia said. You go, girl. You get that job at age six to pay for your out-of-work mom's chemotherapy treatments. The home you save may be your own. There is no shortage of these stories. A couple weeks ago, heartbreaking story in the New York Times went viral. Two-year-old kid in Ohio dying of cancer. This kid loves Christmas, so his family decorated their house early so he could have one last Christmas. And then the whole neighborhood joined in. Everyone decorated their houses. And then the community came together to stage a Christmas parade on the street where this boy lives. And Santa came to the house. It's really hard to sum this one up without getting weepy. It is a beautiful story. There are legit feel-good elements in this story. But buried within it, the feel-bad detail. Though we ought to be ashamed of ourselves angle. The hospital where this little boy was treated, his name is Brody Allen, that hospital isn't charging Brody's family for his care. So on top of losing their child, Brody's family isn't going to be bankrupted by medical bills and his parents and siblings aren't going to lose their home, which is great for Brody's family. But what about all the other families of people being treated for cancer at that same hospital? The teenage boy down the hall dying of the same cancer but whose case hasn't elicited the same outpouring of sympathy. I guess fuck him and fuck his family. Bankruptcy for them. You want your medical debts forgiven? Then you're going to want to make sure the most photogenic, sympathetic kid in your family gets sick and not some moody, spotty teenager. Another example, one that isn't about kids from a couple years back, after the massacre at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando where a homicidal maniac killed 49 people, wounded 53 others, Two of the three hospitals where the injured and dying were taken announced that they wouldn't be charging the survivors or the families of the dead for their care. Those debts would be forgiven. There were people shot in Orlando around the same time, maybe even on the same night. This is America. But their crushing medical bills weren't forgiven because they didn't win, I guess, this extremely perverse lottery. They weren't lucky enough to be the victims of a mass shooting or the victims of this particular mass shooter, I should say, because victims of past mass shootings that failed to elicit the same outpouring of sympathy and support. They didn't see their medical bills forgiven and victims of future mass shootings won't either. So the lesson for all of us, all of us Americans is this. If you get shot in the United States, Be careful to get shot in the right time and in the right place and by the right maniac. Or you're on your own, like that kid with diabetes or that kid with the lemonade stand whose mother has cancer. Jamie Peck wrote something for The Guardian about a kid selling lemonade to pay for her mother's cancer treatments. Not the same kid. A different kid. Namaya Martinez of La Cruces, New Mexico. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. I apologize, La Cruces. She opened a lemonade stand of her own after her mother got sick. ABC News portrayed Nemaya's plight as a feel-good human interest story, Peck wrote. One radio show called the story heartwarming. 
We should call it what it really is, a damning indictment of everything that's wrong with America. 12.5% of Americans are uninsured still, and the Republicans who run everything are doing whatever they can to drive that number up. But even Americans with health insurance are bankrupted routinely by medical bills. It doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to live like this. It isn't this way in Canada or France or Germany or any of the other Western industrialized nations. Right-wingers hate all of those countries now because fuck our allies. So you might want to point out that people don't live this way in Israel either. This insanity, our healthcare system, it has to end the insanity and our healthcare system has to change. And that's not going to happen until we recognize these stories. Stories about terrified children raising money to pay for their parents' chemotherapy treatments with lemonade stands for what they are, propaganda designed to make us feel good about a system we should be ashamed of. Feel bad stories and the drag of feel good stories. Dog shit rolled in powdered sugar. Don't swallow it. Single payer now, Medicare for all now. So when you see one of these stories, one of these feel bad stories, tarted up in the drag of a feel good story, Jump into the comments thread, scream and yell, call the reporter, email the reporter, call the newspaper, call the lousy local TV news station and yell at them for insulting your intelligence and for contributing to this problem. All right, coming up on today's show on the micro edition of the Savage Lovecast, the free edition of the Savage Lovecast, tons of your cues, lots of my A's, and joining us in the micro, Ellen Forney, author of Rocksteady, brilliant advice for my bipolar life, is here to talk about dating with bipolar disorder and other mood disorders. We had a long conversation. It starts in the micro, and our conversation continues into the magnum subscription edition of the Savage Lovecast that you can subscribe to at Savage Lovecast. Dot com. The show is twice as long and no ads. Ellen and I continue to have that conversation. So if you're interested in the subject and you're interested in what Ellen has to say and you haven't tried out the Magnum yet, this might be the month to subscribe to the Magnum and give it a try. All right, all that coming up on today's show. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Everlane, luxury basic clothing and accessories made at ethical factories without those retail markups. For free shipping and to support the Lovecast, go to everlane.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Bull and Branch, luxury, affordable, fair trade certified sheets. Get 50 bucks off a set of sheets plus free shipping by going to bullandbranch.com and entering savage. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron delivers all fresh, high-quality ingredients and recipes you need to create delicious home-cooked meals. Get your first three meals for free by going to blueapron.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. My boyfriend and I recently adopted a dog that we love dearly. The only problem is that our sex life has gone completely downhill after we adopted our dog because he has separation anxiety when we're not in the room with him and when we want to have sex. And then he will also jump up on top of us if we leave him in the room with us. So that's not an option either. Um, and then he is crying and barking if he is not with us in the room and we are having sex because he can't hear our voices and he freaks out when he hears sex sounds. So if you have any advice on what we can do to calm him down or to distract him, or if anyone has ever had this problem before, it would be great to hear some advice. I'm going to kick this one out to anyone who's had this problem before. Are there any dog trainers out there listening right now? You might want to call in and let this person know what they should do because this is outside my not only area of expertise but my area of affection because I don't really like dogs. And if I had a dog that was doing this to me, I wouldn't have a dog a couple of days later. Dot, dot, dot. The question for you, caller, what happens when you go to work? Are you with this dog 24 hours a day? Presumably, there are times when you have to leave the house and the dog can't hear the sounds of your voices. And does he just freak out and bark his fucking head off all day long while you're gone? But feel sorry for your neighbors. If not, there's some moment where he chills the fuck out and gets used to being alone. My advice, not knowing anything about dogs except how much I dislike them, and I say that 
owning two dogs, living with two dogs that belong to my husband and my son. Crate train that thing. When you guys want to go in the bedroom and be alone, put it in the crate. Close the door. Put a blanket over the crate. Let him bark for a while. And you'll be done fucking before he's done barking or he'll be done barking before you're done fucking one or the other. Shopping for clothes. Literally my least favorite activity. However, with Everlane, I can stock up my wardrobe with nice looking threads and feel good about it. And when I say I can stock up my wardrobe, I mean Terry can stock up my wardrobe for me. Everlane started with a basic t-shirt and a simple but bold idea that they could set a new standard for the retail industry. Everlane makes beautiful, long-lasting products, so they only use high-quality materials, and they are trend-averse, just like me. They are not a fast fashion or fashion-forward brand that creates a lot of waste in the retail industry. Instead, they are focused on making classic clothing that can be used and worn year after year. Everlane only works with ethical factories, constantly vetting and evaluating factors like fair wages and safety. They're also environmentally conscious. For example, unlike most manufacturers that produce tons of waste, their denim factory recycles 98% of its water waste, repurposes byproducts, and sends them off to a local brick factory, and those bricks get used to build affordable housing. Everlane reveals how much each item costs from materials to labor to transportation and what their markup is. They believe their customers have a right to know how much their clothes cost to make. Everlane's Timeless Essentials are just what you're looking for. No frills, just quality. Terry is a fan. Nancy is a fan. I am a fan. And you will be a fan too. Right now, you can check out my personalized collection at everlane.com slash savage. Plus, you'll get free shipping on your first order. That's everlane.com slash savage. Everlane.com slash savage. Hi, I'm a queer woman living in the Midwest. I'm dating my first straight man. It's kind of weird because he won't let me hit the prostate. This is something I've never encountered before and I really don't know what to do. I've had two long-term boyfriends before and they were both queer identified and were totally open to butt play and super sexually explorative. I've never had this problem before. I've been with this guy for a little bit over six months and I really love him. I feel like we have great sex, but I love, you know, I love going down on him. I love giving him head, but he will not let me put a finger in his butt or anything like that. And I want to respect his consent, so I haven't pressured him. And I try to talk to him about it, and he just says he's not into it or he doesn't want to try it. This dude was like 40, so I don't, like, I'm just, how did he live his whole life without having his prostate stimulated? I sent him some articles about, like, prostate stimulation, and I recommended that he masturbate, but he just acted awkward about it, and he doesn't know how to talk about it. So should I just let it go? I just want him to feel good. I feel like it's going to be so good for him. I don't know, Dan, what should I do? Um advice from a gay man to this queer woman to get this guy to let me hit the prostate? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to leave his ass alone. That's what you're going to do. You're going to take no for an answer. Not getting to play with his ass, something that you enjoy, maybe the price of admission you're going to have to pay to be with him. You've told him that you enjoy ass play. You told him you would enjoy playing with his ass. It sounds like having his ass played with, at least at this moment, is not something that he is interested in experiencing. And so my advice to you would be, drop it. The one thing least likely to grease the skids for successful ass play is pressure, with tension being a close second. And right now you are pressuring this guy to let you play with his ass, and you're framing it as something you want to do for him, and maybe it is something you want to do for him, but it's not something he wants done to him. So my advice to you would be, Fucking drop it. Stop bringing it up. Stop sending him articles. Stop grieving during the blowjobs you're giving him about the fact that you can't put your finger in his ass. He knows that you would like to go there. And he has filed that away. You've only been dating him six months. And here's the thing. If you ever want him to get comfortable with the idea, you have to drop it. You have to stop pressuring. You have to stop asking. He knows that you would like to go there. He has filed that away. Paradoxically, you're likelier to get in his ass if you stop asking and stop pressuring. He knows you want to go there. If in six months or a year or two years or five years, he decides that he would like to experience this, he may bring it up. 
He may circle back. He may ask you if you're still interested in doing this. He won't get there. He won't get more comfortable with the thought of ass play if you're pressuring him the entire time. Drop it now. Maybe a year from now, you'll be stimulating his prostate. Keep pressing him on it. Keep asking and asking and asking and asking and asking. And you will never get near his prostate. So drop it and you might. Keep it up. Keep the pressure campaign up and you'll never. All that said, some people have hard limits. Some people just don't want to do a thing. And we have to respect those hard limits. No means no. And the last thing you want, if you want him to enjoy anal, is for him to offer you his unenthusiastic consent to get you figuratively off his back about this and then for him to have a bad, potentially even traumatizing experience the first time someone plays with his ass because he was doing it for them and not doing it for himself. So... Drop it. Who's sleeping in your bed? All right. None of my business, unless you call the show, in which case it becomes my business. But I can tell you this. You want the people sleeping and doing other things in your bed to be as comfortable as possible, to want to come back to your bed as often as they're invited, which is why you want bowl and branch sheets. Everything Bowl & Branch makes from bedding to blankets is made from pure 100% organic cotton, which means their products start out super soft and get even softer over time. You buy directly from them, so you're essentially paying wholesale prices. Luxury sheets can cost up to $1,000 in the store, but bowl and branch sheets are only a couple of hundred bucks. Everyone who tries bowl and branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands and thousands of five-star reviews. Bowl and Branch only uses sustainable and responsible methods of sourcing and manufacturing, and they donate a portion of every sale to a charity that helps fight human trafficking while preserving fair prices for consumers. And new sheets are arguably the best gift imaginable. Wouldn't you want someone you sleep with to give you new beautiful sheets? So do it for them and for yourself for those nights that you sleep over at their place. Shipping is free and you can try them for 30 nights. If you don't love them, you can send them back for a refund. But I doubt that you'll want to send them back still. There is no risk, therefore no reason not to give Bowl and Branch a try. To get started, right now my listeners get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com when you use the promo code SAVAGE. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com, promo code SAVAGE. Bowlandbranch.com, promo code SAVAGE. Hey, Dan. Kind of a weird question. I work in a school, and today one of my coworkers was showing pictures on her phone of her new grandson. And one of the pictures she kept showing was him naked because mom's white, dad's black, and so his penis is like brown, but the rest of him is white. And then somebody all of a sudden says, hey, you really should put that away. That could be considered child pornography, and you could lose your job. So just curious what you think. Even though it's her own grandson, should not have that on her phone? Is that child pornography or was that an overreaction? That was an overreaction. If having a picture of a naked infant is child porn, basically every parent and grandparent in the country and on the planet is a child pornographer. In this day and age, though, in the workplace, I would not recommend busting out pictures of the grandchild, particularly if your intent is to draw attention to your infant grandson's genitalia and to your infant grandson's race. Genitals can often be darker in skin tone than the rest of a person's body. It has nothing to do with race mixing. It's not like her grandson has a spot of black. There's so much going on here that's inappropriate and awful. And the thing that's inappropriate and awful isn't a grandma with a picture of the naked infant grandson on her phone. That's perfectly fine and common But everything else, the inappropriate conversation at the workplace, the bizarre racial dimension, stereotypes about black men and their penises and how this conversation and her fascination with her biracial grandson's penis kind of plays into that subtly or non-subtly. Those are the objections that you should raise with her. She shouldn't be talking about her grandson's penis in this way. And at this moment in the workplace, any conversations about penises, however old they are, whoever they're attached to, are inappropriate. The child porn isn't the issue here because that's not child porn. All the other issues are the issue here. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron delivers farm-fresh ingredients and step-by-step recipes right to your door. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. Blue Apron achieves this by supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. 
You choose chef-designed recipes, and they deliver fresh, seasonally-inspired ingredients. You can cook incredible meals in as little as 20 minutes. Terry and I are crazy busy, so it is a real joy for us to let Blue Apron do the menu planning, shopping, and meal prep. Then we, even me, sometimes me, I, someone who never cooked anything more complicated than toast in his whole life, I will cook it up and eat it up. It is so good. And the step-by-step instructions are easy enough for even a cooking idiot like me to follow. On this week's menu, they have seared chicken and brown rice bowl with kale, beet, and goat cheese and spicy shrimp pasta with garlic and broccoli. All this delicious food is quick and easy to prepare and ideal for beginning cooks. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free at blueapron.com slash savage. That's blueapron.com slash savage to get your first three meals for free. You have no excuse not to check Blue Apron out. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Hey, Dan, I'm a 40-something cis lesbian identified woman who recently getting out of an eight-year relationship has started to date again, likely. I have bipolar and spent some time in a mental health facility. I'm not ashamed, and I'm very open about my disorder to um, try to help with destigmatization. The question is, When do you roll this out in the dating process? Joining me in the podcast booth to help tackle this question, cartoonist Ellen Forney is the author of Rock Steady, Brilliant Advice for My Bipolar Life, a self-help handbook on maintaining stability with a mood disorder. Her 2012 graphic memoir, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo and Me, was a New York Times bestseller. And I'm proud to say she's someone I've known for years. How are you? Good. How are you? We've known each other since... 1993. Forever. Oh. Also, if you ever visit Seattle and you come up to Capitol Hill on the light rail system, you will see Ellen's beautiful art all over both Capitol Hill stations. Ellen is an iconic Seattle graphic artist. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And I'm so happy to be here. It's great to have you. You've poured so much of your life and, and so much of your hard-earned wisdom into your new memoir uh, to help other people with mood disorders achieve, how would you describe stability? Well, actually, um, so my memoir was the was Marbles, mm-hmm. Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me. It's been really difficult to kind of describe my new book, Rock Steady, because it's it's comics, but it's not really a a graphic memoir, memoir exactly. So it's it's self help. There's but it's there's, so much more. I, I I read it over right. the weekend. It's so much more than just self help. Uh, it's it, incredibly entertaining. It's incredibly insightful. Um, it's going to be a huge help to anyone with a mood disorder, but also to anyone who loves or interacts with or dates or knows somebody with a mood disorder, which is everybody. Right, right, exactly. Well, so Marbles basically was my personal story with a lot of very specific information folded in. Like rather than just I tried CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, but actually putting in an exercise And then um, I heard from readers for years about how helpful they found that and how a a number of them told me that they used it like a manual. Mm -hmm. So I figured that I I should do a manual. So that's what Rocksteady is. So in in Marbles, those sort of tips really were digressions and about your own experience. And this is much more comprehensive. uh, Rocksteady is. Exactly. uh, And more self-helpy. Right. And a guide. Right. Um, I'm a big fan of Smedmerts. Can you tell us who (laughs) Smedmerts is? So Smedmerts is basically my uh, strategy that I present in Rocksteady for maintaining stability or for taking care of yourself pretty much for anybody. So it's an acronym that means uh, sleep, meds. If you take meds, take your meds, uh, eat well, uh, see your doctor or otherwise stick to whatever treatment uh, works for you, mindfulness, meditation, exercise, uh, routine, sticking to a good routine. T is coping tools, which is a little bit of a cheat, and support <laughs> system, Smedmerts. And Smedmerts, because you're a graphic artist, is your mascot. It's a little character who pops up throughout the book. Yes, a, an, an awkward little snaggletooth monster is how it's been described, and I can't really argue with that. Yep. Uh, it's the, uh, You know how I love things like DTMFA, uh, mm-hmm. I love my acronyms, and I just right. think Smedmerts is a terrific example of that kind of brand new term, word, acronym, and right. it's really smart and arresting. Thank you. And it's not just, I think, something that 
a person who has a mood disorder would benefit from embracing. We could all use better coping mechanisms. We could all use, uh, you know, to go see the doctor to get our exercise, to stick to a routine, to eat right. The one really that I think is most important is sleep. And that's why it's first. And that's really important for everyone. It really is. You're rolling your eyes. Are you having trouble sleeping yourself? I had surgery on my shoulder a month and a half ago almost. And I've had to wear this giant sling. Mm -hmm. I believe despite our long history, this is the first time you've seen me in a sling. Mm -hmm. I've had to wear this sling 24 hours a day for the last five weeks. And I I have to take my wedding ring off at night because I can't sleep because I can feel it. I'm having to wear this enormous contraption. All right. night long, I basically haven't slept for more than a couple of hours at a go for weeks. Right, you know, losing right. Losing my mind. Well, how, well, exactly. I'm losing my mind. I mean, that's just the thing. It affects everything, right? I mean, sleep is, you know, whatever, your, your cell degeneration and your digestion and pretty much every body process that you can think of. But then also your mental processes. It, it affects your mood. Like you just said, it's driving me crazy. It's a little bit like uh, I've compared it to the grief I experienced after my mother died where I would just be somewhere randomly and burst into tears. Mm-hmm. Like five weeks of no sleep, I have been somewhere randomly and burst into tears. Right. I'm like, oh, this is as bad as the trauma of my mother's death. Right. This not sleeping for a month and a half. Right, right, exactly. And then if you have a mood disorder on top of that where your 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 mind and your system is more fragile, it can be that much more dangerous. It could send you off into a manic episode or into a deep pit of depression. Right. Right, exactly. Okay, so let's get quickly to the the caller's question. Mm-hmm. When do you roll this out in the dating process? This is somebody with a mood disorder, somebody she says she has bipolar disorder. Um, she's stable, she's healthy, she's perhaps uh, read your books and has a Smedmertz doll on her <laughs> on her bed or on her nightstand to remind her. Um, when do you, her question is really simple. When do you roll this out? When do you disclose and how do you disclose? I, I think it's pretty much the same as anything that is really personal and important to you that doesn't come up naturally in conversation. But that has a huge stigma attached to it. Well, sure, sure. I mean, if you think about maybe... Uh, having a really weird kink, if I could use the word weird. <laughs> like some of, one of the things that makes kinks fun is that they're transgressive. So if kinks yeah, are real, all blasé sure, about kinks, okay. then it kind of drains the joy from them. So. Right. Okay. But so when do you tell? I mean, when do you tell someone that you have this thing that's really important to you, that's an important part of you? Um, you make that decision Depending on the context and depending on how you feel about them, how important are they to them? Well, your kinks are something you're going to want to involve your partner in. You're going to right. want to have this kind of kinky sex ideally with your partner or with your partner's permission if they're not interested and they're willing to allow you to explore those other people. Um, your mood disorder isn't necessarily something that you're going to want to involve your partner in in the same way. Maybe you're going to want your partner's support. They're going to be a part of your support system, but they're not implicated in your mood disorder in the same way or involved in it in the same way. Are they? Well, it, it's a... It's complicated. It's definitely complicated. Um, so the last S in Smedmertz is your support system. And that's the people that are close to you. Mm-hmm. And one would assume, ideally, that your partner is close to you. And they're the ones that you're sleeping next to. And they're the ones that get the, get the brunt of your unpredictability, if you, if you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, it, so they are an important part. Of, of uh, your support system. But like with a kink, I want you to do bondage with me. With a mood disorder that you're disclosing, I don't want you to have a mood disorder with me. You right. just have a right or need to know about this so that you're part of my support system? Well, certainly with somebody that you are dating, ideally they don't immediately become part of your support system, like an, like an intrinsic part of your support system. I mean, are, are you Because most people you date are going to disappear from your life in short order. Oh. Well, I mean, we date a lot of people. We partner with very few. Right, right, right. So, how how interested is the is the caller in in this person's being their partner? Or, I mean, if she wants to vet them right away, be like, if if they're not going to be able to deal with this, if they have this idea of this stigma and can't be reeducated, mm-hmm. then it's not worth my time. Exactly. You know? So you can, so, you know, if she's comfortable, you know, she can do that. I have to say, I, I know a whole lot of shoulds. You know, mm. I should uh, take the time to, to talk about it calmly. And, you know, this is, this is something that is an important part of me. I just want you to let, I would just want to let you know that I have this thing. And, 
and 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 really be aware that maybe he will you know reject me for it and I'll be ready for it. you know like all these different cautions that I might take mm. but uh but with him I just blurted it out <laughs> <laughs> And you know, it turned out okay. We've been together for nine years. So it's not what I would recommend. The blurting really. out The method. blurting. The blurting. But, but one of the things that I really, really try to make clear in Rocksteady is that you can mess up. Mm-hmm. Is that you can mess up. You can do all of these different shoulds. And, and you know, uh, m- most of the time you can either fix it or live with it or go on. One door closes, another door opens, you know. It's not like some gymnastics move that if you execute it perfectly, you win. Like you can execute this disclosure imperfectly and still win. Even if that right. person if that person reveals to you in that moment, you know, as I like to say, when you tell someone you're pause or you're kinky or you're trans or whatever, you're telling them one right. thing about you, their reaction tells you everything you need to know about them, mm-hmm. including whether there's someone you could date or tolerate or re-educate if they're just reacting impulsively or negatively out of ignorance. Right. Um, and it's kind of a sorting hat moment. You get to put that sorting hat on their head and they tell you whether or not they deserve you or are the right person for you to invest any more time or emotional energy in. And you want to, I think, roll out the disclosure in a way that demonstrate you have some emotional intelligence. So you're demonstrating to them that you are someone they would want to be with. But their reaction, you shouldn't fear. Their rejection, even, you shouldn't fear. Because if they can't handle you, they don't deserve you. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing to remember is that you could do all of those things perfectly. You can be you know, protecting yourself and you can be all ready for it and... And then let's say it doesn't go well and you get a rejection. You're like, oh, I didn't realize I was, I thought that I was ready to be rejected. And now I'm, you know, distraught and. Rejection's still going to hurt. Yeah. It's a balm to tell yourself they didn't deserve me. It's still going to sting. And so, so then you turn to other tools. Okay. Then you, then you turn to your journal and drawing, or you turn to your, your best friend and say, you know, I, I, I thought it was going to go okay and it didn't. And I feel like I messed up and. You know, they'll say, no, you, you, did, you did everything just right and mm-hmm. let's go get some ice cream, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, on the flip side, uh, we're talking with somebody, you know, to someone who has bipolar mm. disorder. Is that, that has, is that the term of art? Should I not call it bipolar disorder? Do you say someone with bipolar? What do you say? Well, a lot of people say bipolar as a noun. To be honest, I'm still getting used to that. Just like anything, the language changes over time. You want to say to someone they're disordered. Right. I'm just wondering if that itself reinforces the stigma. But anyway, that wasn't my question. So somebody who has bipolar, is bipolar, um, is going to roll that out at their own at a time of their choosing. Is someone who's dating someone who's bipolar have a right to know? Is it something that you are obligated to disclose? I think eventually. I mean, I mean, wouldn't you wouldn't you think that about anything that's an important part of who you are? Yeah, I, I, of course. But when something is so deeply stigmatized, when it's about your health, some would argue, I think, that you don't have an obligation to disclose. I don't think you'd want to be in a relationship with someone if you have a mood disorder where they might encounter you, you know, if you're slipping into depression or becoming manic and not know how to react and not know what's going on. I think you'd want your partner to be informed. My question is, does your partner have a right to be informed? You know, as someone... As someone who has bipolar myself, you know, and not being in that other position, I, I, I feel like I would be speaking for someone else in a way. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think, yeah. I mean, I, m- most people who have bipolar have a lot to deal with, whether they keep cycling, whether they cycle sometimes, whether or not they're not cycling right now, what but maybe they will. What do you mean by cycling, will. quickly? So um, cycling would be if you're going through some sort of mood episode. Mm. Like, for example, if, you, uh, if you're manic. So if you're not sleeping very much and you're really speedy and your judgment gets off and you're really impulsive, that would be mania. Okay, and so, so you might want your partner episode. to know that you're bipolar in case this happens. Partly so they can support you. Well, I mean... You- it it can be hard, I know, if your partner, who is caring and warm and concerned, uh, says, you know, honey, you're you're talking really fast and you're interrupting me. Do you think, you know, do you think maybe you're oh, whatever? Like he does he doesn't say, you know, like, are you taking your meds? Uh-huh. But you know, it would 
be a not unfair question, which I would resent and be frustrated about and, and have to listen to. Getting back to the caller's question, when do you roll it out? Is there a time? Would you put a date on it? Like two months in, three months in, six months in? Or case by case? I, I, I guess I would say case by case. I, I think that um, you and I have talked about, you know, uh, if you have a kink and rolling it out, oh, let's say, I don't know, from anywhere between two dates to, a, I think a couple months might be a little long. Well, Maybe it's similar to rolling out the kink because I think people should wait about three months. I think if you're dating someone that you presume to be vanilla, who knows, maybe you'll disclose that your kink and they'll share it or have their own kinks to disclose and you win. Uh, but three months, they know that you, maybe you've had enough vanilla sex for them to be assured that vanilla sex is something that you're good at too and enjoy as well. Whereas if you just blurt it out on the first date in the first 30 seconds, unless you met them on a kink app or dating site or event, you just blurt out your kinks. They may think that that's all you're interested in or all you're about, but you've demonstrated to them that vanilla sex and you're a good time and that this is something that's a part of your life. It's not all your life. Maybe it's similar to this. If you blurt it out in the first 10 seconds, does it put it, does it make it... Have you not given them a chance to see that you are stable, that you are fun, that this isn't all you're about, and you're not getting on a roller coaster with me, but this is a fact about me that you would need to know if we get more serious from three months on? Well, I I would go back to one of the things that's really important that the caller said, though, is that she is open about it, that she is open about it, and that she feels strongly about that um, in her um, priority of decreasing the stigma. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a good chance that she, she, that it, that it might be appropriate for her to tell sooner than later. But she asked us, like she is open about it and wants to decrease the stigma, but she is asking us from a dating strategy point of view, when, when to disclose. That was her question. Right. Right. To someone new, someone that she, hasn't known very well or very long who, although she lives openly and her friends and family know, maybe her coworkers, that some new person she met on OkCupid, maybe it's not on her profile. And there is that question of then when to tell this person. Right. And my recommendation would be a few dates in or a couple months in. Right. Right. Um, and uh, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wrote the book. I'm not telling you. Well, That's you know, a, my, my hot so, take. I mean, I'm curious I guess, what your informed lived experience take right. is. Well, I'll say what my own lived experience is. Um, it's, it's different now from before marbles came out in 2012. I'm very out very publicly here. I am on the radio, you mm -hmm. know, talking about it. It comes up really quickly in conversation because one of the most benign questions that people ask is what do you do? And I say, I'm a cartoonist and they say, might I know anything of yours? And I say, well, I wrote a graphic memoir it's about my bipolar disorder. And part of that is because of my confidence from all of these years, mm -hmm. knowing myself and knowing that I'm okay and that I have plenty of company in what I'm dealing with. And part of it is really feeling like being, uh, being out and telling my personal story is a very important part of getting rid of the stigma or at least decreasing the stigma. When if, did you tell your current partner? Well, it's hard to say. <laughs> I was visiting another. We didn't really date. Mm -hmm. We just kind of hung out and then slept together pretty quickly. <laughs> and I really, I told him by accident, um, kind well, sort of by accident. I he was he was in my hotel room. It was late at night, and I had to take my meds. And I had my meds in my hand, and he was in the shower. And I had to decide if I was going to be like all, you know, like stigma busting, you know, like this is before marbles came out mm -hmm. stigma busting, you know, like I'm, I'm going to take the pills in front of him and be bipolar and be fine because it's fine. Or do I, or do I wait and take the cautious route? And he came out of the shower and I still had my meds in my hand. And so I just blurted it out with absolutely no sense of what I would do if I was rejected. Or and you're still together nine years later. So and the we're blurt still together out nine method years in later. your personal experience works well. Although he does say that the blurt was a concern, <laughs> that it was a concern. And his, his uh, take on it, we were just talking about this recently. His take on it was that... Um, I was interesting enough and that the rest of me kind of was compelling enough that he would just kind of hold that in the balance and 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 keep on and see what happened. Ellen Forney is the author of Rock Steady Brilliant Advice for My Bipolar Life, also the author and illustrator, cartoonist. Both of these are graphic 
One's a graphic memoir. One's a graphic self-help book uh, of marbles. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. Ellen and I had a lot more to talk about. I threw a couple of other questions at her. That conversation continues on the Magnum edition of the Savage Lovecast that you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com. Hi, Dan and the tech savvy at risk youth. My wife and I recently purchased a house that we're renovating. And the other day I was here with our contractor and a plumber that my wife has never met. And um, we're outside looking at a part of the project and the uh, uh, contractor, as my wife is pulling in with her car, the contractor says, hey, let's play a joke on, on, your, on your wife. And I said, okay, that sounds fun. Uh, I didn't know what he had in mind, but he seems like a pretty good guy. And uh, anyway, so she walks up and says, uh, he, he looks at her and says, you're in big trouble. And her eyes go very wide. And he said, yeah, it's really bad. And she said, oh, my God, what did I do? And he said, uh, unbeknownst to any of us, well, we're going to have to take you upstairs and dress you in red spandex and give you a good spanking. Now, listen, we're, we're, we're very liberal and open people, but we don't really know this guy. And I had no idea he was going to say that. My wife basically looked do- uh, very wide-eyed and didn't know what to say and effectively just kind of walked away. And uh, as she was walking away, the, the plumber that was with us that had never met her just said, hey, I'm Mike the plumber, and he obviously didn't know what to say either. Um, he didn't know the contractor either. So at any point, she went inside, and, and the contractor looked at me and said, she didn't think that was very funny, did she? And I, I didn't know what to say at the time. Um, I said, no, I don't, think, I don't think anybody thought it was really funny. I know he, I think he meant it in jest. Um, it just was a very strange thing to say out of the blue to some folks that you don't know very well. And um, later on, I wish I would have said, and this was my great comeback, you know, two hours later, hey, if anybody's going upstairs and getting dressed in red spandex and getting spanked, it's going to be me. But I didn't think about it. Subsequently, my wife feels very, she doesn't want to be alone at the house with the contractor or the workers. Um, she's feeling very, very violated. Uh, and like I said, it was just a strange thing to say, uh, just kind of out of the blue. But anyway, Dan, we don't know the social norm. The question is, what, what's the right thing to say in that situation? Um, is there a right thing to say? Is there a right? I didn't know what to say, and I don't think any of us did. So, hey, help me out. Thank you, sir. You're fired. That's the right thing to say in a situation like this. You're fired. You want to create a social norm around not saying creepy, inappropriate sexual things to the woman you're working for and proving in that moment that you have no boundaries or impulse control? You fire people who say those creepy, inappropriate things, and you tell them why you're firing them. Your comeback, if anyone's going to be wearing the red spandex and getting spanked, it's me, is terrible. I'm sorry. I know that you think you had a wisdom of the staircase moment, but that's terrible because we are building on his joke, which in a way communicates to him that there wasn't really a problem with his joke, except that it was, it didn't land. And that wasn't the problem with the joke. The problem was that he made that joke at all. So right now your wife feels unsafe in her own home because this asshole made that inappropriate comment and you're wondering what to do. You fire the motherfucker. You fire the contractor and you tell him why you're firing him. And if you gave a key to the house to the contractor so they could have access to it when you were away, you change the fucking locks even if you demand the key back. It's often hard to respond appropriately in the moment when somebody violates a social norm like don't say creepy, shitty, inappropriate sexual things to a woman or anyone else because there's a social norm around not making people uncomfortable. There's a social norm around de-escalation. And so we, myself included, sometimes fail to push back in the moment in the way that we should. But there's still time for the pushback. And that time is now. Fire the fucking contractor. Find a new contractor. And make sure the contractor knows why he lost that gig. Even if it delays the renovation of your home for a few months, your wife's sense of safety and security are more important than getting the renos done. Hi, Dan. This is in response to the caller in episode 624 who was thinking that maybe she was little sometimes and was really stressed out and having a hard time kind of keeping her little space under wraps when she was, you know, in a position to have to be a muggle. I just wanted to say that that happens to me sometimes too. 
when I'm really stressed out. And it is really imperative that for me that I find some space to little, even if it's just by myself when I'm in private. And that helps me a lot to be big when I have to be big. So an idea for this caller would be to specifically plan a night to eat macaroni and cheese and watch animated movies and color or play with sensory sand or take a bubble bath with those like crayons that draw all over your shower. Just almost anything that can be little just to kind of fill that need so that you can muggle when you have to muggle. I hope that helps and welcome to the Little Club. Hi there. Uh, this is a response to the gal in the previous episode who thought she might want to explore little play. I would say, first of all, I, I, I'm in a, a little caregiver relationship, and I am the little, and I'm not a baby. I'm a big girl. But if your partner already lets you call him daddy, I would say that you're pretty much most of the way there with knowing that he'd be fine with it. Part of the ways that we got into it is, you know, do you have any stuffed animals around? If he's all squicked out that you're a grown woman with stuffed animals, then that's a big red flag. If you don't have any stuffies, you need to get some. And probably the first thing that I would do, definitely the first thing that we did in our relationship in figuring out that this was something that worked for our relationship dynamic was to ask him to tuck you in. Mr. Would you tuck me in? And if he's game for that and enjoys it and is good at it, then I think you're good to go. And it's just baby steps from there. Hi, I was calling in response to the woman who's seeing a guy that was frequenting illegal or legal rather brothels uh, without her consent. I just want to say you sound so hot. Like seriously, I heard your voice and I thought, wow, you sound beautiful. And then you just said that the situation was making you feel hideous, even though you know you're not. And that just breaks my heart. So please don't. This has so nothing to do with what you're not. It sounds like you've already done a whole lot of work trying to figure him out and like give him what he needs I hope he's done half that with you because what I'm I've been seeing a lot of lately is uh, women that I know bending over backwards to just understand why the dudes they're with are being shit and the guys don't do a damn thing you deserve so much better yes definitely yell at him if he doesn't respond in a way that just opens up a whole new door as to the kind of person you know he's never shown himself to be able to be walk and we're going to leave it there 206-302-2064 is the number here at the savage Lovecast. if you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show give us a buzz 206-302-2064 Tickets are going fast for the premiere of the 14th annual Hump Film Festival with all new films at the audiences in San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and Olympia get to vote on and award huge cash prizes, including a new $10,000 Best in Show award to the filmmakers. Go check out the trailer and the film descriptions at humpfilmfest.com and then get your tickets for the premiere of the 14th annual Hump in Seattle, Portland, Olympia, and new this year in San Francisco. Quickly, they are selling out. And then, of course, in 2019, 14th Annual Hump will tour the country. We're going to be in more than 60 cities in 2019 with this year's festival. Can't wait to bring Hump to you. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow the amazing Ellen Fornay at Ellen underscore Fornay. That's F O R N. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at Rescue and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with an installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thanks for having